So I want to start off with, what is play? And we had a wonderful description of a play scenario from Dr. Hanley earlier today, right? The 10 kids out uh, and coming together and having this fabulous play episode, which sounded like it was an extended narrative so where kids were joining their stories together and, and entering into a fantasy that had magic potions and various things being cooked up and so forth and so on. That takes a lot of different kinds of skills to do. For 10 kids to maintain the same imaginary scenario and make it work over an extended period of time is not something easy. I would imagine if we divided you all into groups of 10 and asked you to come up with an extended pretend play scenario that you could all keep up with the program, remember your roles and what everybody else's role is and how you'd all intersect, we'd find it very difficult. And we sometimes, I think, underestimate how much children show us about their learning and development through play when they're given the opportunity to show us. We heard a lot about um, uh, the, the notion of um, how kids are doing, and we've heard about some of the fabulous work you've done here in the Yukon in tracking children at the, develop, uh, at the community level, using the tools available and using them in a, a way that lines them up and makes sense to practitioners. And that's a very good way to identify how kids are doing and if kids are okay. Okay, and, and identify the kids who are, or the groups of kids who may need extra efforts. And that's very important. But it doesn't really tell us how kids are doing beyond good enough, right? Those are valuable tools that tell us if kids are in trouble or not, or tend to be having some difficulties, or needing extra efforts. And we need those tools, and we need to pay attention to them and incorporate them into our work. But I propose that we also need to have ways to, to identify, to know how kids are doing much more than good enough. Are they thriving? Are they flourishing? A term that's used in the Pathways to Wellness uh, document that's here today. Are they flourishing? And we don't get it from those tools. That's not the intent of those tools. Kids tend to top out in those tools. Okay, we don't know what, they, what is beyond those tools, but if we pay close attention to their play, we can become quite knowledgeable about the extent of their skills and knowledge. Now, there's a lot of discussion in my field, my, my tribe, as I call it, early childhood education, and I think amongst educators, and I also would family literacy people uh, and family support about what is play and is that kind of play really play if adults have a role in it or is it only when it's child driven or child directed that it's actually play and so forth and so on. And I suggest we kind of set that aside and just think about play is something that's fun, that is enjoyable, where there's a imagination, exploration, and all those other things. I'm reminded of a scene many, many decades ago when I was young and first uh, working with young children and families. And uh, one of my responsibilities was to take a group of children from the child care center across the street to the neighborhood public school where there was a combined four-year-old and five-year-old room. In fact, the youngest kids in the fall would only have been just a little over three and a half years, so they're fairly young. And I take them over, and it was, I must say, a fabulous play-based classroom. There was lots of activity, lots of interesting things to do, and so forth and so on. But it was, organ and this is a long time ago, 1976. So it was organized, though, into two types of activities. There were work activities, and there were play activities. Okay, and you had to sort of sign up to do enough of the workstations that you could go and do all the play things. And play included tricycles and the dramatic plays and so forth and so on. And one little girl was very intently at an easel. I used to often stay longer and sort of transition the kids I was bringing into the program and I really enjoyed it so it was a fun place to be. So this one little girl is very really concentrating at the art easel on her painting, very deliberately choosing the colors, and, and you could see that there was a lot going into this. 
And I sat down beside her and eventually got talking about her painting and what she was doing. And I said to her, are you going to play now? And she said, shh, don't tell Mrs. Sproul, the teacher, but guess what? She thinks this is work <laughs> and it's play. I hope I can stay here. I get, she likes work and she thinks this is work. <laughs> and, you know, so I think we have to think about play when we're really, really enjoying it. Maybe sometimes work transitions into play in all kinds of different ways. A similar situation with a game that was laid out at the tables um, where uh, it was called a number line game. The idea is it's like snakes and ladders, only simplified. You go forward, you go back, you roll a dice, and kids play it together. And it's not really a competition as much as getting all the animals to the cage or the zoo or something like that, or to the water. And again, there was a little boy who thought he had outsmarted Mrs. Sproul because he got to count this as work. And he liked to do this and the climber. And Mrs. Sproul didn't know that he was doing two things of play all, all afternoon. Because to him, the work of the number line game was play. So before we, because I think sometimes we have a lot of debate about, um, you know, is that really play if there's adult involvement or adult, if there's boundaries from the adult or not. And maybe we get, that's not the most important aspect of what is play. Maybe it's more about the level of engagement, enjoyment, and fun we're having.